Welcome back to another episode of the podcast, From the Depths of Darkness to the Light of Success. I am your host, Chris Swick, and on this podcast, we talk about mental health, addictions, brain injuries, ADHD, and really anything anyone's afraid to talk about, we talk about it on this show. Let's not be afraid to talk about anything going on in your life. I truly believe sharing your story and being vulnerable helps add confidence to your life. I believe everyone's story is valuable at the end of the day. does not matter what walk of life you come from. We are all welcome on this platform. Before we get started, though, head over to the YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notifications, and head over to Instagram and check me out at Depths of Dark Side. With no further ado, from Cleveland, Ohio, I got Drew Chernisky on the show today to talk about her brain injury and many other things in the mental health realm today. You want to take it away and let them know a little bit about you, please, Drew? Sure. Thanks for having me, Chris. I'm really excited to talk. I'm Drew, and I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I um, suffered a traumatic brain injury in October of 2018 playing ice hockey, and so I have embarked on that journey ever since and have faced a lot of challenges, but it has also been a really profound learning experience and transformation for me, which I'm sure we'll get into much more detail on. So I think that pretty much covers my journey and what we'll be talking about. Just like us up north of the border, we love our hockey too. So that's amazing. Right. Do you still play hockey today or is that sort of that sort of part of your journey done now because of the traumatic brain injury? That's I'm definitely retired now since since the brain injury. Yeah, but it's been part of my life and I'm sure in many ways it'll still continue to be part of my life, but no longer playing. And what sort of level did you make it to at that point? Like how old were you when the brain injury happened? Yeah, so I put on my first pair of skates when I was three years old. I played through college and after college I was playing on a, a post-collegiate team where we traveled all over, played at nationals, and basically a lot of us played at college in college at one point and got together, formed these teams. And yeah, so when I suffered my traumatic brain injury, I was 28, 28 years old. And how did that come out about four years? Okay. And how did that, so the TBI traumatic brain injury affect your day-to-day life when it first happened? Yeah. So it was a pretty drastic and sudden change. Just within one second, everything changed for me. Almost immediately, I had actually, yes, immediately I had vision issues from the moment of the injury and impact. I blacked out and developed all these symptoms. And as, as time went on, it just more and more things started to build onto it. So the first things were headaches, vision issues, double vision, blurred vision, dizziness, and a lot of other things. But as time went on, more things started to come up, migraines, chronic migraines, and a lot of stuff. And how do you, before we came on to record, you said you just came out of a migraine too. How do you deal with your migraines? Are you on medication? I know other people, like I know my partner has migraines, chronic migraines as well due to other things and has now been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, so chronic pain. Do you have any medications you take or is it, do you do it naturally? Yes. After trying about seven different types of medications for the migraines, which cause even worse side effects and didn't actually take the migraine away, I had to turn to some alternative things. So yeah, no medications currently for the migraines, just have to try to get into basically a Zen space relax as much as possible. Um, and I've been using an infrared heating pad and taking some nutraceutical, some natural supplements and things like that to try to get myself out of it. Anyone out there that has suffered a traumatic brain injury, what is some good pieces of advice you could give them? Oh, that's a good question. So I think the first thing is to try to be as transparent as possible. A lot of the things I was experiencing for a long time, I kept to myself. And one of the biggest challenges of the recovery for me was that feeling of isolation from people and society and where you really fit in anymore. Because depending on how how it has affected your daily functioning, you might not feel like you're contributing as much as before or doing as much as you wanted to do. And it really gets in the way of your everyday living activities. By hiding those things and not really opening up about them with other people, it leads to, it's like counterproductive because it leads to even more isolation. So I think the first thing would be to be transparent because it's often very liberating and can be a release and a burden off of your shoulders. Another thing is to 
be kind to yourself. It's something I'm still working on because uh, you can become very frustrated with yourself when you can't complete a task like you were able to do before the injury or things are so much harder and so much more of a challenge for you to do. that. And they're just like very straightforward and simple activities and they could just wipe you out for the entire day. And then you might beat yourself up about it. But again, it's counterproductive because then you know, you're getting into this cycle of not being kind to yourself. And it's really important to just have that gentleness and kindness. And the way I look at it now is, would I treat my loved one the way I'm treating myself right now? And the answer almost always is no, because I would be treating them with more kindness, more empathy, more compassion than I would have treated myself with. So that's another big one in this recovery that I think is important. And I think just always... Maybe another thing is just always focusing on what you're grateful for on any given day. I think one of the biggest tools that has kept me afloat in this recovery is practicing gratitude every single day. And I'm sure some people might be thinking, oh, wow, how could practicing gratitude really change anything for me? But in my experience, it is really just in, in some of my darkest and hard, hardest moments, just thinking of three things I'm grateful for could really just keep it going, bring you some hope, bring you some optimism that you really just needed to keep going. And uh, aside from the fact that practicing gratitude, it really changes the brain and it can create and produce all of these uplifting neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. And you could just feel like happier and healthier from it. So I think those are probably the biggest three. I really like dial back a little bit there talking about self-love. That is such an important one for sure. Not always beating yourself up, but it is hard for someone struggling with mental health, mental illness, or early in recovery from an addiction or a brain injury and stuff like that. When you're used to being able to do all these different things, and then all of a sudden it's almost like it's stripped away from you, but you got to show yourself that compassion. Like you said, I I like how you said, you know, would I treat my loved ones or my friends like this? And the answer is always no. It's true though. If you're not So you should show yourself that same compassion, but it's, I find it much harder to show yourself love than it is to show others love. Sometimes you're absolutely self, like so many people, including myself, I can only speak for myself, self-sabotage things in my life a lot because I think I'm not good enough or I'm not doing something like someone else is. I'm always comparing myself to others. We got to stop comparing ourselves to others too. And show ourselves that compassion for sure. Yeah. I like that you say that. Yeah, I think that's another thing that was a big challenge as well is just that constant comparing yourself with what other people are doing, what other people are getting done on a daily basis. And you have to remind yourself that this isn't a light challenge. This isn't a light burden. Like you are going through something and you shouldn't try to minimize it or dismiss it. So I think just really eliminating that comparison to other people is also really important, like you said. And I like that you brought up vulnerability at the beginning of after my last question there too. Being vulnerable is huge. Not holding that in, not thinking you're going to be a burden on someone because you're not a burden. You, The more you share, the more liberating it is, like you said. And I find being vulnerable really is liberating in its own sense, sharing that story of yours because you never know who it's going to help. And I find being vulnerable helps you be more confident in so many different aspects and areas of life too. If you just learn to be honest with yourself, will help you be honest with others at the end of the day too. And not holding in those, we're, we all have feelings and we should all share them though too, to help one another. Yeah. And for me, vulnerability is still, it's uncomfortable. It's definitely uncomfortable when you're being fully transparent and vulnerable with others, but it's so important. And it just, it helps, helps you connect with other people. And in the greater picture is you can really help so many people in your situation just based on sharing your story and being completely transparent 100 percent, just being that transparent and like you said it, it is uncomfortable like when i started getting vulnerable and sharing different things and probably for yourself as well you get that feeling of anxiety right in the pit of your stomach but after but after you've those words spewed out of your mouth or what you wanted to get off your chest came out it's just like this like aura lifting over you that is just feels so amazing and and full of gratitude too. So what are you grateful for today? 
I am grateful just to be alive. I'm grateful that the sun is shining and I am grateful for my incredible support system, my friends and family. And yeah, I could go on, but the, the, there's just so much to be grateful for. That's amazing. And I'm grateful that we're able to record this episode today. I'm grateful that your migraines subsided and it's yeah. just grateful for life as well. And just being able to meet the many people full of zest in life on this show that I have here. And we're able to share our stories and just have these open lines of communication, open chats about mental health, whatever yeah. it is that's going on as well. It, it just feels so good to be able to help others. Yeah, absolutely. I am really grateful for your podcast as well and the ability to just talk about these things and hopefully really have an impression on somebody. For sure. No, I want to talk a little bit about the road to your recovery. So what has the road to recovery looked like for you over the last several years? And it probably started real minuscule and you had to build things up. So my recovery, that's a loaded question. So let's see, it started with all these different rehabilitation programs, focusing on rewiring the brain, creating new pathways, reversing some of the visual issues I experienced, which a lot of these things are still a work in progress today. But during those times, thinking back in, at various points in my recovery, just the progress is very slow. And I'm not saying this is for everybody, but for me personally, is very slow and very incremental. We might just take one baby step forward on one day. There are many setbacks. It's definitely not a linear process. And I think for me, I had some unrealistic expectations of how it would go, which, you know, I pictured it just being this upward trend always. There's, but it's really just up, down, up, down. It's like ebbs you know, and flows. Yeah, it, exactly. It's like yeah. everything in recovery based as well. It doesn't matter if you're recovering from addictions, brain injuries, eating right. disorders. It's not one linear path at all. And that's what I thought it was too. And it sounds like that's what you thought it should right. be. Too. <laughs> yeah, we all, exactly. we all have these unrealistic expectations. I remember when I started this show it was just going to blow up and be the next best thing. But no, it's a slow process. And once I started doing some more research, it was like, no, it takes two to three years to build a podcast. We're near to it, slowly building. And it'll yeah. take those little mini steps, tiny steps, not yeah. big steps. <laughs> yeah. And I think going back to one of your earlier questions, so you experience these setbacks. And in those moments, because the progress is slow and then you have a setback. And then you get really down about it. You get really hard on yourself. You just get sucked into this abyss, this dark belt, black hole where you're like, oh my gosh. I have this setback, like, how am I going to get back on track? How am I going to keep going and all this stuff? But you have to always realize that those come to an end. You'll get back on track. You need to be kind to yourself. And, you know, after a setback, now, all I say now is what so has to happen after a setback is a comeback. And so you're always going to be focused on the comeback and just retrain your focus and that you are going to bounce back from that. And a little bump, you can just... Think of it as, well, what can I learn from? You're learning something from every single part of the recovery. And I think that's really important to stop and think about those things and then keep moving along. And do you like doing like research on all these different things with TBIs and stuff like that? Have you dedicated some time to doing research to learn more about it? Learn, all right, why am I feeling like this? Or why am I acting like this? Or why is my vision like this? Have you done your own research as well? along with going to specialists and stuff like that? Yeah, so I have done, gosh, I have done so, so much research on this topic. All things brain-related, everything, even things I've not been personally affected by, but I'll talk to somebody who's going through it, and it, it will just, this injury really sparks this passion within me to just research it all and find out more information and continue learning in order to help other people and help myself as well, but definitely help other people in the process. And also learning to then try to put it in words to communicate with others, the loved ones who don't can't fully comprehend what the person's going through that suffered the injury. It's really hard. It's really hard for people to fully understand and comprehend what that person's going through. Yeah. I've done a ton of research. Thankfully, I have medical background. I was working in the emergency department as a physician assistant before this injury. And the injury, you 
forced me out of that workplace. But even then, I was seeing patients in the ER and coming in with brain injuries, head injuries of all different varieties and severities. And even then, having that knowledge, I still didn't fully comprehend and really discuss with the patient how the recovery might go, how important it would be to do certain things after. So this entire experience has been really profound in that not only have I learned so much on a personal level, but also on a medical level and also just trying to help out other people with that knowledge as well. I love doing that too, like just researching different things and you give yourself that knowledge as well. And you're not just spewing out garbage on social media or giving your own. We're all entitled to our own opinions, but sometimes it's nice to have facts to back up those opinions as well. Right. Or learn new things about what makes people tick or what makes people do the things they do or why brain injuries cause, you know, our ways of thinking to go a little sideways and stuff like that. Because I, I think there needs to be more awareness around the brain injuries and stuff, that, you know, and all those types of things. Because I've suffered concussions playing hockey growing up as well. I didn't end my career per se. I have a severe neck injury now too that is painful, but I'm not getting neck surgery. Yeah. I don't plan to. My doctor said it's not the path to go. Because it's, it's a really, the percentage isn't there to make it worth the while to go get the surgery done at the end of the day and those types of things. But I, I feel it's really good to do the research and learn different things and teach yourself too. It's fun to learn different things all the time, I think. Yeah. And you brought up a good point about you suffered concussions in ice hockey and did a lot of reflecting on my entire career, but especially in college hockey, I suffered several brain injuries then. And it was like the mentality, the the competitive culture was, oh, you had a little head injury. You're just going to get a drink of water and get back out there. And even my teammates would do the same thing and we would often hide it. And just because we wanted to get back out there, we didn't want to let the team down. We didn't want to do all that stuff. But there's just, there's a lot more awareness now, especially with TBI and sports and all that. But there's still definitely a long way to go. 100%. And I, and I like, I remember the other day I was watching the Edmonton Calgary game. And when Mike Smith got ran, but the ref's like, no, you got to go. Like his head got hit with the helmet came flying off. He said he felt fine, but it. That was a protocol and I like right. that protocol and the refs can do that now. It's not just how they feel or whatever. It's there's been some serious injuries over time in tons of sports, uh, but yeah. especially hockey, the hitting in hockey and football too. You know, that when you look at like videos of the brains and it's just like a bowl of jello floating around in right. there, basically, uh, it's, exactly. it's, it's definitely a serious thing that needs to be brought to more people's attention because I have lots of friends that have suffered brain injuries and they're just not the same. Yep, that's very really true. And there are millions of people that are suffering with the chronic ailments from TBI today, living with disability of some sort. Yeah, well, and I'm so happy that you're here to talk about all these things too. And I want to bring up your blog too. So how is starting that blog that you have really helped you? Yeah, so that goes back to the transparency part of it. I was, I first had the idea to start it. The idea itself was very daunting. So then I sat on the idea for months and months. And then finally, I was like, okay, I should, I could, I should really do this. I should really do this, not just for myself, but for other people. And so then, you know, I started to think and plan it out a little bit more in my head. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to do this. So I put it all together, got it done. And I did it. And it was, like you said earlier, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of emotions involved in that and definitely a lot of hesitation, which is what I experienced. For, but what, once I started it, and even now, if I post things, it still feels a bit uncomfortable allowing people to just see all these really intimate parts of your recovery and things like that. But what it has done for me is initially I was writing about what I have lost during this time period. And so what I have missed out on and all this, all these different things. And so somewhere along the way, I started to think and reflect as I was reading some of my writing and because a lot of the stuff I wrote along the way in my recovery and I'm just sharing it in retrospect now, but, and a lot of it now is new as well. But as I was going through it and looking, you can just see that there's been a change. And so the change is happening and it's very transformational. 
And so when I started to shift my mindset into what have I gained from this, not just what have I lost, because there, there are definitely some things I have lost, but what have I gained from this? And then just retraining my focus on that and just thinking of all the different areas in which my life has changed for the better from this has allowed me to really just be more complete and whole and fulfilled. And just sharing my story in general has allowed me to make so many connections with other people. I've received so much support from people I don't know, people just reaching out, loved ones of others suffering the effects of brain trauma and how it has helped them understand their daughter, their friend better in the process. And that alone is just like one of the greatest feelings because you know that you're making some sort of difference. Even if it's one person, I went into my blog thinking if I could just help one person in this process with this blog, then that will have been a success. And so knowing that I've definitely helped more than one person, I've connected with so many people is just a really wonderful and profound experience for me. And it, it just really helped to make those connections and feel like you have like that purpose you lost is now back and transformed into a different way. I love that. That's my whole goal too, is as long as we can help one person, if one person listens to this episode or that episode or likes my post, I don't give a shit anymore. I, I love that you're talking about what you're, what you thought about what someone will think, but who gives a shit what people think? As long as you have created that from your heart and you believe in it, that's all that matters. Who gives a shit what others think about what you post or what you wrote, but you're yeah. writing that for yourself in hopes to and hopes to help someone yeah. and it, it seems to be doing that. So congratulations and just keep pushing forward on that blog. I Thank don't know, you. how often do you create or post on your blog? I was trying to do like a blog post once a week and with the natural trend of the recovery, it hasn't happened that frequently with migraines and whatever else. But I tried to post as much as possible as my brain allows. At least one or two a month is my goal. So yeah, it's been, um, it's been quite the experience. And that, it's okay. Like I was doing two episodes a week and sometimes you just got to do what's best for you. If it's not feeling right, I don't like to just rush something either. I've been learning right. that too. if I don't feel I can give my best to an episode and I'm going to rush through it and make it, there's no point. I like to put my all into something if I'm going to do it as well. So. I'm not a, I, we're, no one's a perfectionist or anything, but I like to see, seem to think I am some days, but I know <laughs> I'm not, but I don't like to, if I'm not going to put my best into something with them, why do it as well? And then I'll just right. take that week off or with everything going on, moving and doing all these renovations right now and stuff. I, I just can't give all my focus to that. So I'm not, don't want to put out a piece of shit episode uh, per se, yeah, if exactly. I can't give it my all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually going off of that, I started to get into this, this kind of cycle where I was like pressuring myself and like, oh, I need to get this done. I need to get this out. And then it's, but it's not how I want it to be. So I can't publish it. It's not how it's not done yet. There's no point in rushing it. And so you just got to take a step back, take your time if you need it and just tend to your own needs. So that's and what you, I, I've learned. And we don't owe anyone anything. So like at the end of the day, Yes, you may have people that are, and I don't owe anyone an apology, but sometimes I'll post on my story on Instagram or let's use that as an example and just say, Hey, sorry for this. I'm sure y'all understand and everyone's going through something. Or if you're having a rough personal time right now with your depression or anxiety or whatever else you may suffer from, it, it's okay to take a step back and just take a break, take some time for yourself and rediscover yourself, reinvent, do those types of things. I'll go back to the drawing board. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think that's really important. So who are three people that you look up to and why do you look up to them? Okay. Three people I look up to. I look up to my sister, Brooke. I look up to her because she has always been there from day one. She is loving, caring, understanding. And especially during this recovery has never, never once made me feel like she was judging me or wasn't there or anything like that. So she's one of them. I look up to, actually, if I had to say I look up to, it's hard to narrow it down to three, but because I, I'm the youngest of 10 children, so I look up to a lot of my siblings. But It's quite a big family. Um, Holy cow. 
Yeah. The advocacy is huge. It's definitely huge. I'm glad you brought that up because for a good portion of my recovery, I really needed help with the advocacy part of it. I struggled advocating for myself and leaning on on people who could advocate for me was really important. My sister was one of those. My other sister, Quinn, was one of those. Just a lot of different people that kind of stepped up and helped me with the advocacy portion because when you're in that situation, it can be definitely hard for to practice that self-advocacy and speak up. Yeah, advocating is huge. And that's why I like to be a voice for the voiceless. There's so many people out there that need your voice or just need to hear what you're saying or how you did it. Tell people how you did it. I find sharing your experiences really helps one another, helps another person it could. So it's huge to really everyone out there listening. You got to advocate for yourself sometimes and not just take the first answer from a doctor. But it's not the right answer always. Sometimes you just need to dig deeper and maybe do a little bit of your own research too and just keep digging there. We have the internet out there for a reason. Use it wisely. Right. Yeah. Yeah, actually so important to give a voice to the voiceless. I was one of those for probably two years of my recovery or maybe longer where I felt like I really didn't have a voice in the process and that some of that came from my own personal struggles. A huge portion of that actually occurred because of some of the medical providers I was seeing and and being met with some dismissiveness and lack of empathy, lack of kindness, and even lack of understanding, which also ties into the awareness of brain injury and brain trauma and how even the experts and medical professionals also lack, lack that awareness. It's not just a lay people societal thing. It's This is also rampant in the medical community as well, which is really unfortunate. And so going from that role from provider to patient, I wasn't, I wasn't spared from experiencing that. I still experienced that. And it was a very hard thing for me. And I felt like I, I could no longer speak up or really express what was happening because I was met with misunderstanding, skepticism. And, and some of those providers made decisions and recommendations that were not intentionally meant to sabotage my recovery or intentionally meant to be malicious, but they did turn out to be that way. And like you said, it's really important to always get a second opinion, third opinion, and really have somebody to advocate for you in those situations. Yeah, and I like that you bring that up too, because, you know, lots of, there's so much going on. I can't speak for the United States, but I can speak up here where I live here in Canada. Just the way people are treated sometimes, especially in the mental health realm and stuff like that is, is very disheartening and discouraging when I talk to friends that are have attempted suicide and they go in to try and get help and they can't get help. Oh, you, we'll put you on a waiting list for four weeks. No, that person needs help now, not in three to four weeks, especially with the way the suicide rates are going with how young they're getting now, because we don't have the funding. The funding's not going to the right places and the government, it, it's right there in front of them, but they're not wanting to do anything about it. Sorry to say. And that's right. why I become advocating for mental health addictions and stuff like that. Like even me wanting to get into recovery the last time, well, they're like, oh, you had to go off this medication and that medication though. But no, this medication is helping me with my mental illness and that's what it's for. Oh no, it's a narcotic. We can't have that at our treatment center. It's just, it's, there's no win-win. It's like, it's, I can't go to treatment now because they want me to go off my medication that's actually for a mental illness. Do you want to see me while I'm not on it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, just so many different aspects that just things need to get better up here too. I'm sure it's the same down there as well. Yeah, absolutely. There's and even sorry to Butu to add in like the nurses or people in the mental health departments or in the in departments at the hospital, like openly making fun. And I've heard this from many people, like making fun of people that are having a mental illness or a mental health crisis and stuff like that, and openly talking amongst each other, basically laughing, and making you the laughing stock while you're in there trying to get help. Though, yeah, like it's sad. there's a lot that needs to change for sure. That's definitely been. The experience here, and I've heard that from many others who have been in similar recoveries as well, just connecting with people through my blog, on social media or wherever. Like you said, those experiences are truly happening and it's really disappointing. It's a shame that that is happening. And these are trained, they say, professional healthcare providers and 
I'm sure they didn't teach you to be like that when you went to school or whatever, to be a nurse or a doctor and those types of things. And right. just, it's going to be okay. You're okay. You're you suck it up sort of thing. That's that mentality still. And it's got to change those, the wording and the way you talk to people has to change too. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a huge problem. And, you know, somewhere along the way, I don't know if I know at least for some people experiencing burnout or whatever causes them to lose some of that empathy and compassion. But for others, that's not always the case. But regardless, there are definitely some major things that need to change in the medical system for sure. What's one or two major points that you think need to change? Your point of view. I think one thing is for providers to have that empathy because if you don't have that patient provider relationship is not really built on trust. How can you trust the process? How can you go in and fully understand what they want to do treatment wise or anything like that? If you lack that understanding and if you feel pressured or if you feel rushed every time you, you go to see this provider and if you're, if they lack that empathy, you're not going to really have that full trust and you might feel like they're dismissing you in some way. And, and that's really not what you need in, in a recovery like that of any sort. The other thing is that I think providers need to keep an open mind and be willing to actually hear what the patient is bringing them. Uh, through my research, going back to the research thing, through my research, I found all these different, you know, treatment possibilities and potentials that could help me. And if I brought them into my providers and said, I think I want to try this, and they immediately dismissed it and said, no, wouldn't even look into it at all, wouldn't read anything about it. That's a very close-minded approach. And if they genuinely cared about you getting better, then they might take the time to actually consider what you're saying and might open their minds to something else. And I think a lot of that at times has to do with maybe ego, like Maybe it wasn't their idea, so maybe they don't want you to do it. Uh, another thing could be they lack the time or whatever else and don't have the time to do it. But even providers who said, there's nothing else to do for you, I would bring these ideas and things to them and they still would say, no, that, no, we're not going to look into that or anything. I just think that's really poor care and I think that's really bad medicine. It's laziness, I find too. And then you have providers or doctors you know, that here's this medication, try this one. I don't even know what I'm taking sometimes, but then I, you have to go do your own research to find these side effects. Exactly. Go, oh, this is why I feel like this. Or I wasn't properly, when I was on some antipsychotics, so there's a little story too. Like I was never taught, Hey, don't go off these cold Turkey. Like that wasn't even led. And that was one of the top ones. Do not go off these cold Turkey. And what do I do? Go off from cold Turkey. And it was hell for almost a week and a half. Like I was supposed to wean off these things, especially at the dose I was at and not go off cold turkey. And it was, I'm glad I don't live in that condo anymore because yeah. my neighbors hated me for a week and a half. It was just a week and a half of night tears and everything. Oh like, my gosh. It yeah. was insane, but that wasn't, took my fiance actually going and doing the research and Christy should have not gone off those cold turkey. But you know, some of these medications, there's so many different more avenues than Here's some medication because some of the stuff they give you, it, it doesn't even do anything. It's like basically just creating you to be a zombie and they, they will just get rid of this out of society if we just give them this. Yeah. And basically just become like, there's no emotion anymore. There's no nothing. You don't even get to feel the emotions that you should be feeling. It's almost like you're numbing that pain again with drugs and alcohol. Like exactly. Someone that's in recovery and this will help you sleep. Like you're not even supposed to take the things I was taking for sleep. That's what they gave me for sleep and antipsychotic. Like, yeah. Why? After I do your own research, just that's just my own experience. I'm sure there's many others that have had these experiences out there too, but I can only speak for myself. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And that's been my experience as well. It's after trying you know, these almost four years of this recovery, I think I tried almost 30 different medications. And that's just an insane amount of medications, especially for, for anybody, but especially like younger people. And it was almost like every single appointment I was walking in to see this doctor who just was a pharmaceutical vending machine. <laughs> which one, which one can I give her today? Uh, we'll yeah. just switch to this other one. We'll just switch to this next one. And then out pops the, the pills from the vending machine and you walk home 
you get side effects and crazy things and more setbacks. And it's just like a never ending cycle. If you keep it's a vicious cycle. Back. Yeah, exactly. And it's just, in my experience, it was either that or it was just do it yourself. And so you go to these providers because you're in this desperate situation where you don't know what to do and you feel alone and that happens. And then it turns into, oh, okay. Well, I guess it is a do it yourself thing. And so you're just fending for yourself at that point and it's even more isolating. So it just perpetuates that, that issue. Now it brings me to my thoughts or a question I have next to, what are your thoughts on the, it's slowly coming, you know, about and becoming more legal with the microdosing with psycho, with the mushrooms and those types of things and the hallucinogenics. Now, what are your thoughts there? I know lots of people are using them and starting to use them. I've had friends that have used them. Actually, I've had a guest on the show way back last year. Same thing. He, it, uh, he does not take anything for his bipolar disorder. Actually, he started microdosing and it's, and he's a musician and it's just, it's been so much better microdosing. He found that's, that was his take on it. I've yeah. seen other people, athletes and stuff getting into it, especially hockey players I follow. And yeah, I've heard a few podcasts about different people microdosing. Actually, one of them was a former NHL player who suffered several traumatic brain injuries. Maybe you're talking about the same person. I can't remember his name right now, but Daniel Carcillo. Yes. Yep. That's it. Yeah. So yeah, I've listened to a few podcasts and it seems like that's really benefiting um, a lot of people that are doing the microdosing. I haven't done enough personal research myself to really make a sound strong, take a strong stance on it, but it does seem like that is helping a lot of people that are doing the microdosing for sure. Now, would it be something that you would consider trying for yourself or would you stay away from that? I think I'd probably stay away from that for now, unless I did did some research on it, which I'm planning on doing. And if it's based on what I find and the knowledge I find, then I would definitely consider. Yeah. And I've heard many other things and for my partner too, like she uses CBD and marijuana and stuff, but for her pain and it really does help. Like she has chronic asthma as well, so she can't smoke anything, but there's so many topical creams, CBD or THC capsules and stuff like that. And those things, those natural things, I do believe in. I've done lots of research myself <laughs> and lots of other people that I've talked to that are very knowledgeable in that field. And lots of, it's a good alternative is the best way to put it. If that's yeah. something you want to get into, but I suggest I'm not a medical, this is just my own personal opinion. We're not medical professionals here or anything. You're probably more of a medical professional than I am, but, but I, I suggest talking to your healthcare provider before you do go just d deep dive into something or do your own research like you were talking about as well. Right. Yeah. I think it's really important to have some professional guidance on that if you're going to do it for sure. Leads into my last and final question, but what is the benefits of taking calculated risks in your life? Taking calculated risks. I think the benefits are to basically just training your brain to go after what you want, not holding back. I think a challenge from this recovery has been there's there is definitely some fear, some fear that was instilled in me that I carried from that experience. And taking some calculated risks retrains you to live fearlessly and go after those things that seem too big or unattainable or whatever that may be. And if you feel like you can take those risks, I think the rewards would be so profound that you would not regret it. I love that you say that, taking those risks and becoming fearless, just going after what you want to go after your dreams is what I took away from that. Yeah. Thanks. Before we go though, can you let everyone know where they can find that blog of yours, follow you on social media and stuff like that? Where can they find you? And I'll put all this stuff in the show notes as well. Everyone. Oh yeah. So my blog, the website is liftthefog.net and my Instagram is liftthefog. Sounds good. And I will put all that in the show notes again. And before we go, though, I would like to say thank you so much for coming on the show today, Drew. It was truly a pleasure chatting and getting some more insights, getting an insight from someone that's suffered from a TBI, a traumatic brain injury. So thank you again for coming on the show. And if there's one or two things that I could take away from today's show is show compassion, show kindness, and give yourself self-love, everyone. Definitely. And thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful that we had this conversation and really hope that we can touch at least one person from this podcast for sure. It was a pleasure having you on. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. You too.